Thank you, ladies. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. We're glad you're here tonight. Y'all here tonight, aren't you? Yeah. yeah, that's better. Praise the Lord. You got to wake up. So we're going to be with, get with the program. It is good to see you. Uh, I'm excited. My my big brother's here tonight, Brother Phil Arms. Praise the Lord. Don't turn me off. And uh, he'll be sharing this series of messages on Islam. And I told him, you know, if we don't get it covered this Wednesday and next Wednesday, we can, we can always add one more, can't we? So we'll see how it goes. But I am excited that he is here with us tonight. And Phil was here a few months ago preaching to our men's dinner. We had a great, great turnout, great time in the Lord. So uh, he earned another privilege. All right. So it's like I had to earn my privileges. <laughs> But I appreciate Brother Phil. He uh, had so much to do with opening doors for me in the early days of my ministry. And everybody in the world was calling him, and he couldn't take everything. So I got to pick the crumbs off the master's table, so, uh, which I appreciated. And now, here you are. Amen. So praise the Lord. So uh, y'all give Brother Phil a, a big Believer's Fellowship welcome. I know I need someone to help me up the stairs these days. I am his older brother. He's bigger, but uh, I'm older. So uh, <laughs> he's always been bigger. I'm so glad to be here. It's a privilege and an honor. And uh, it's always amazed me the way that God has used Brother Joe from the inception of his ministry. And of course, I guess that's true of all of us who go into ministry, hopefully we grow uh, spiritually and uh, the work of our hands grow if they're anointed and blessed of the Lord. And this church has done such an incredible job of persistent, aggressive growth. And I see so many friends here tonight. It's such a joy to, to be able to bask in the glory of that fellowship and be reminded of all the good memories that so many of you bring to, to my life. So tonight we're going to talk about Islam. There is so much that it defies my ability anyway to get it in a uh, small package of two or three messages, which is what our, our hope is to do tonight and, and this, later this week. But uh, we'll try and I'll cover just, uh, just lay some foundation work tonight and deal with the basic concepts of how the scriptures deal with uh, Islam as well as many other cults. And uh, to begin a study on Islam, you have to first recognize it not as a religion. It's a totalitarian ideology. In fact, it's more a political organization than it is a religious one. So with that in mind, you might want to take notes tonight. I, I pray you do. But I would like you for you to open your Bibles to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to read, if I can find my reading glasses. I'm old. There. My head's crooked. The glasses are straight. All right. 1 Peter chapter 3. Why don't I hear the pages turning? I know that you all believe the Bible, most of you. You ought to carry it with you when you go to church, especially when you go to church. First Peter chapter 3, we're going to read in 14 in just a moment. But let me qualify what I'm going to start saying by saying this. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States. Uh, in fact, it's the fastest growing religion in the world. Uh, it's taken over Europe. We're going to be looking at some of the ways that it's made inroads into our national life and looking at the, how it was preceded that in Europe and how it's begun to influence uh, their government uh, beyond belief. Not only is it the fastest one, by the way, it, uh, it took the place of Satanism, which was the fastest growing religion in America. And now it's Islam, and it's a dangerous, it's more dangerous than Satanism. And you'll see that as we or why that is as we unfold the pages and look behind the veil. One of the reasons it's uh, most dangerous is because the people involved in it, its target audience, if you would, is easily radicalized. There are very few, there are some, but there are very few moderates within the Islamic faith. 
So they are easily to fanaticize, to sign up and register for the jihad, which is their holy war, with the intent to take over the nations which they infiltrate and the peoples who live in those nations. And the reason that they're so easily radicalized, as opposed to other religions, is because about 80% of the Muslims in the Middle East and Northern Africa are illiterate. They cannot read, they cannot write, and so they rely upon radical, fanatical imams to give them direction, to give them uh, the idea of what is right and what is wrong, and they look to them for their instructions. Now, here in 1 Peter chapter 3, 14, because this isn't just about Islam, it is what is our responsibility? What is your responsibility to those who are involved in Islam and to those who are apt, are apt to be influenced by Islam? And don't think for a moment that it's not coming. If it hasn't touched your life, it's going to. So you better be prepared on how to deal with it. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Underline that word if you're taking notes. It means uh, basically the same word as intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Well, how do you avoid being intimidated? Verse 15 tells you. It says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. How do you sanctify that which is already sanctified? The word sanctify there means what it means everywhere else in the Bible, to set aside as holy. And setting your heart aside and sanctifying your heart, you're setting yourself aside. You cannot become a Christian unless you're willing to set yourself aside. To be Christianized is to be sanctified, and there's actual sanctification, just like there is in uh, righteousness. There's imputed righteousness. We have imputed sanctification, but we also have actualized sanctification, which only results as we individually attack those issues in our life which are not of God. And we get those out of our lives. And here it says, Sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready, listen to this, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, if I may summarize what that said, it says, You know the Word of God enough and you know how to use the Word of God skillfully enough to deal with those who confront you when they are arguing their position or debating their faith with you. Most Christians today are not as able nor as articulate as the pagans that surround us. Most Christians today are extremely biblically illiterate Ignorance plagues the church. We go to church where we can sit and get pre-digested food from a pastor who's digested it and then spills it out on us, and we carry very little of that out with us into the world to deal with our individual lives. You get most people past John 3.16, and they're puzzled. What more is there than John 3.16? Or there's a whole Bible. And unless you know God's Word, you cannot answer the pagans who approach you. And you better get skillful in using it in, in, in light of what you're about to face. It is the Word of God that will silence the critics. It answers the critics. And they cannot respond to it. And I know that most Christians today are extremely fearful. It's rude, I'm sorry, but I'm a little dry today. Most Christians today are extremely fearful of having a Jehovah's Witness knock on their door because they really don't know what to say. So they're just saying, well, the Bible says, let you be a curse, so go to hell, get out of here. <laughs> you have a responsibility to them further than that. Be ready to answer every man. 
We're afraid of Jehovah's Witness. We're afraid to talk to the Mormons. We're afraid to talk to the Muslims because we might not understand what we're talking about. They understand what they're talking about, and they've studied how to answer your rebuttals and your debates. We don't know how because we don't study the Word of God. And the Bible says, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word. That doesn't mean you just chop it up and contextually use what you want to use in an argument. It means that you are able to rightly divide it so that you can take on any topic that is thrown at you by pagans. So, understand what you're up against. False religions of any kind, including Islam, they cannot rely upon the Word of God. The Word of God is the only book that has absolutes that are immutable, irrefutable, unchanging. Other religions, including Islam, have only the Word of man to rely upon. And we'll see that more and more as we go through this series. But they don't have what we have. Their quality is not there. Their quantity is not there. Their abundance is not there. They don't rely on faith. They rely on works. In fact, the, the, really the subtext, and Joe and I were talking about this before church, the subtext of every, every religion in the world outside Christianity is works. None of them are based on faith. You ask any of these people outside Christianity, how do you get saved? They say, well, you know, we just, we just have to obey. You have to keep working for it. You keep doing and doing. And you never know how much is enough. How much is enough? How much do you have to work? Many church members are like this. They're always just, I mean, they're at church because they know if they don't go to church, they may go to hell. They quit this or they quit that because they don't want to go to hell. You'd be surprised how many people in the Christian faith go to bed every night not knowing if they'd go to heaven when they wake up. So what we? we always get right with God at night. You ever notice how easy it is to get in bed at night and say, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. Try doing that in the morning when your flesh is crawling to get out. That's the God way. You die daily. Any other way, any approach to righteousness and sanctification is an effort of the flesh. It will keep you moving, moving, doing, being religious. You know, I remember our daughters, uh, when they were younger, had a little, uh, what do they call those little rat looking, hamster, hamster. And I'd walk by their room and I'd see that little hamster. You could hear him go, coming up the stairs. He'd be, oh, when you're coming upstairs, not the hamster. You'd hear him in his little wheel going, chick, 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 chick. and you knew what the sound was. You walk back by there a little later, that he's still chick, 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 running around on that wheel, just going as fast as he can. I got up one night and I went somewhere and I came back by the room and, chick, 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 and the little hamster was just going and I stopped and I watched that hamster and I'm thinking, where does he think he's going? How long can he run to get there and not accomplish anything? How many of you know Christians like that? The more they work, the more they think they're going to succeed in this righteous call of their lives. So many depend upon their own efforts. And God said it's just a matter of accepting the finished work of the cross. But Islam is based on subservient subservient works. Now some say, you know, you want to be careful. You don't want to offend the Muslims. There's a great effort today to be politically correct in all that we say about the Muslim faith, and we've been intimidated. A few years ago, I remember I was doing a series when I first started dealing with this issue, and uh, I got a call before the, I think it was the second or the third part of the series. I was doing it on Sunday nights, or Wednesday nights, and the Houston Police Department called, and they said, you know, we would like to send some patrol cars up there and some police officers up there. And I said, well, what are you talking about? They said, well, surely you've been getting threats. And we had. 
They said, we've been receiving threats here saying that they're going to blow the, your church up and they're going to kill and maim and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we want to have a presence there. And I said, please don't do that. I said, you can send up uh, one undercover uh, cop and put him in the, in the church and a patrol car outside, but not any more than one. And they said, well, why is that? Because it looks like we're running scared when we go to all the preparation to deal with the devil, except the one thing God told us to do, and that is use the weapons of the Spirit of God. And I remember as I got up to preach, I had reason to rethink my theology real quick, because 15 Muslims walked in in their little headscarves and everything, 15 men, and they walk in in single file, and they sit in the middle of the church, right in the middle. And they are going to cause trouble. But the Word of God and the Spirit of God is so all-consuming that they can do nothing but sit there and listen to me preach about Jesus versus Muhammad. At the end of the, the service, they got up, single file, they walk out the door, and right when they get to the door in unison, they say, Akbar! It was a big victory for them, they thought. Allah Akbar is their statement that God is great. God is great, but they've got the wrong God. And I remember a couple of weeks later, we were doing a crusade at uh, Del Mar Stadium, football stadium, not far. And the Houston or the Harris County Sheriff's Department called and went through the same thing. And I said, we don't want all that. We reject all that. They said, well, it's not optional. We want to have officers there. That's our job to protect citizenry. So without anything to do about it, they have two policemen that show up every night, walk me onto the field to the platform where the preaching took place. One would stand there. I mean, I felt like Louis Farrakhan and this posse. You know, you've seen those guys. <laughs> Made you feel real important. A bit of a distraction, however. Well, tonight, I'm here to tell you that in spite of all the resistance and all the, uh, the papers and all the statements and all the rigmarole that a ton of Muslims in that four-week period got saved. I mean, it went on our radio and television program. They were calling, they were writing, they were coming by hungry. They had never heard the uncompromising Word of God. And they came, and they called, and I would talk to them, and so many of them would get saved, and they would say, you know, well, uh, we have to be careful. I said, what do you mean you be careful? They said, if we, if we are seen going into a church, or if anyone in the Muslim community accepts Christ, they kill us. I was dubious. I said, well, how... How do you figure that is? I mean, you, you can't just kill someone and they disappear. People talk. Until man, they would each say, well, the, there's a tight-knit group in the Muslim community who live by Sharia law. We'll talk about that next week. And because no one knows a lot of us, we live so inclusive in our group, that one can disappear, or two or three can disappear, and no questions are asked. They just aren't there anymore. In fact, there is a statement in the Quran that if an if a Islam person, a Muslim, listens or hears the gospel, just hears it, they're to have their ears cut off. So they are very careful about what they do in relation to responding to the gospel, but in spite of that, hundreds of them in that period of time got saved, received Christ. And why is that? It's not because of my great preaching, but because of the fact that the truth is presented without apology, without pseudo-tolerance, and they receive it. You understand this about the gospel, it offends it offends. It's going to make people mad. People say, well, you know, I don't want to make anybody mad. I just want to kind of sneak up on, to, on them and preach. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. They get angry. And if we do what most churches do, and most pastors and most preachers and most Christians do today, if we limit our message to those that it does not offend, 
We don't have a message. Consequently, the vacuum, the spiritual vacuum that plagues the church, the cross, Paul wrote, is a, is a stumbling block. It's an offense to the Jews and a stumbling block to the others. It causes people to rile up with their righteous indignation, to strike out. And we're living in that era right now in the United States. It's not just the Muslims who are attacking us. For some time we've been assaulted by our own government the philosophy of education, the philosophy of government, the fields of entertainment, the music world, all have combined their efforts and now are focused on intimidation, mocking, making fun of Christians, trying to belittle them. Now, back to Islam a moment. A lot of people become, and this is true not only in American prisons where it's rampant, Islam, but it's worked its way into the elitist of our country. And there's this thing called the, uh, the uh, Lawrence of Arabia complex. People who think that it's an exotic religion, it's an exotic, exciting, intellectually stimulating religion. But the fact of the matter is, it is the most ridiculous pile of religious gobbledygook that has ever been put together and assembled by anyone. Its message is demonic. Its truths are deceptive. It is convoluted in its application. It confuses all the elements and times of history. They come, they've got Jesus at one point walking with Moses and, and Noah talking to Abraham. It's a total train wreck, theologically speaking. And yet, some so-called intellectuals receive this. And it's fine. When you confront them, of course, there's always an out that they have to make the application to your argument. But the New Testament, and that's the ultimate truth, the Word of God, the New Testament says, for instance, Jesus came and he died on the cross to save us from our sin. But the Koran says Jesus did not die on a cross. He was not crucified. And certainly not to die for our sins. The Koran is in direct comp competition with, but it's also in total contradiction to the Word of God. So I, I remember when I was delivering this, and I was talking about the intellectual uh, elite in the Muslim world who have to ignore so much error. And I got a call. The second program we aired on television, I got a call from a Muslim leader in League City. He was a neurologist, a doctor, very brilliant man, and a very kind, sweet man. Sincere, but sincerely lost. And he called and said, I'm, he said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a head of the church. I'm the standing lay imam in our church, in our, in our, in our mosque, which is their church. And I'm head of the congregation there, and he said, I've heard you preach, and I'd like to come and sit down and discuss Islam and Christianity with you. So I said, great. I said, I'll be preaching on it Sunday morning. Come. And he did, and he sat on the front row. And I said, we'll go to lunch afterwards, and we did. And we began to talk, and I said, well, what does the Quran say about sin? What's the Quran's answer for sin? He said, the Quran does not deal with, has no answer for man's sin. He said, we have no concept of redemption. How do you have a religion that's supposed to draw you to God and you have no concept of redemption? He said, we have no answer for it. And they don't. The only answer that they can possibly come up with is works. You've got to please God. Allah. And subsequently, Muhammad. Now, I want to give you three very quickly fundamental concepts of Islam. These are, the whole religion is based on these three concepts. It's like, like a three-legged stool, if you would. One of those legs falls off, the whole thing topples. Number one, the God of Islam is Allah. Number two, the prophet 
of Islam is Muhammad. The book, number three, of Islam is the Quran. Now, let me give you one of the big myths that you hear about today. And I, I, you know, every time I hear them say this on the media or the TV, and this again is a, one of the ways that we try to tolerate the Muslim religion, their big statement is this that Allah, their God, is the same as the God of the Bible. They say the same God that spoke to Adam and Eve and spoke to Abraham and spoke to Noah and spoke to Moses, that's the same God that spoke to Muhammad and the same God that gave us the Koran. Well, all you have to do to find the truth that Allah is not the Lord God of the Bible is go to any library in the world and begin a small effort to research what the encyclopedia says. And what you'll find out is this. This is the main ingredient that's very important to the concept of him being their prophet, Muhammad being their prophet. The God, this is what they'll all say, the God of Islam has a prophet named Muhammad. And that prophet of that religion was around, and that God, by the way, Allah, was around a long time, a long time, hundreds of years before the inception of the Quran and its principles. Muhammad is the one that said, I, I've come up with these, I've had these special revelations. But they'll all tell you in the books, the reference books, that Allah was the name of a pre-Islamic deity. He was there a long time before Muhammad. He was the god of the pagans in that part of the world. They had rejected the gospel hundreds of years prior to that. And, and Allah was just another one of the pagan gods that was worshipped in the stone temple that they have in Mecca. There were 360 deities, gods, if you would, that had their names inscribed in the stones of this stone temple. And by the way, the Muslims tell us, well, you know, Adam is the one that built that thing. Adam built the stone temple, the one that's so important to them in, Me in Mecca. He said, they, they say that Adam built, and then Abraham came along a little later, and he rebuilt it. Again, a real problem with history there. But this temple that they've got there is a stupendous thing. And according to archaeologists, it had always been for hundreds of years prior to Islam, prior to Muhammad, prior to the Quran, it had stood there as a house of worship, if you would, or the headquarters of these 360 deities. And Allah was just one of them. And they worshipped Allah along with hundreds of others of these pagan gods and false gods. So Allah, whenever you talk about it in terms of being God, remember it is not God, and don't let anybody slip that on you, over on you. Allah is just as pagan as Baal, or Moloch, or Isis, or Thor, or any other of the false gods of any culture. And remember this too, Islam did not come along till 600 years after the birth of Jesus. 600 years had passed since the giving of the scriptures and since the coming death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this pagan deity, and people say, well, how do you know he was a pagan deity? You know, don't take my word for it. Do your homework. If you want to find out anything about in academia, you go to the sources of that handle your topic, and you look it up and you study. If you're going to study this, the first thing you do is you go to the general reference works. You don't go to you go to the Britannic Encyclopedia. That'll that's a good start. Any major encyclopedia. Don't go to religious encyclopedias. First, you go to the general published encyclopedias. If a professor tells you, I want you to write a paper. 
and I want you to write a paper on X, you begin with general reference works. That's the expectation, and that is the traditional approach. If you look up Allah, and you can do it tonight when you get home. You don't have to believe me. Look in any encyclopedia in your house or your library, and you'll find the same thing. And it explains very clearly how the name Allah is found in ancient Arabic text and inscriptions all over that part of the world. Long before there was a Muhammad. Long before Islam. Long before the Quran, every single one of those works tells you the exact same thing. And then you go to your secondary level. You go to the religious uh, encyclopedias. Go to Hastings Religions and Ethics Encyclopedia, and you'll find everything that's said in the general reference is also said in the reference of specifics. Allah was an Arabic deity worshipped by the pagans long before the times of the Quran. And by the way, Allah was not a common name. Neither was Muhammad. You know the number one name of the, of, of, in, in the world. More people are named Muhammad than any other name in the world. Which tell you, tells you the, the reverence that these people in this religion have for their God. Then you go to the third layer of research. What do you find there? You go, and when I say the third layer, you go to the research that deals specifically with the area that you're researching. For there's encyclopedias of biology and science and math and engineering, and there's encyclopedias that deal specifically with Islam. And you go and you start reading and you find out there the same thing. Allah was one of these pre-existent uh, gods that were worshipped by the people again long before Mohammed demanded it. And they were worshipped, where else? In Mecca, long before they were told to go to Mecca and worship. And if you listen to the senior professors, I mean, who've studied this stuff all their lives, they all tell you the same thing, that Allah was a god one of 360 deities that were worshipped in the Meccan temples of our day, long before Islam became a word uttered by human lips. So the bottom line is this. And again, we're dealing with the, 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 the legs that hold up the stool that props up religion. So Allah, remember this, and any time you hear this, you ought to get the back of your neck hairs just standing up. Allah is not just another name for God. Never has been, never will be. How many of you have ever found it in your Bible? Jesus never said Allah. You don't find it in the New Testament. You don't find it in the Old Testament. The name was never spoken by the prophets or the apostles or anyone else in the scriptures. It is not biblical. Well, where'd they get this name? Well, Allah was the name of the moon god. That was his position in the hierarchy of all these 360 gods. And as the moon god, they tell us, he married the sun goddess, and between them they produced three daughters. And the original Quran said that we're to worship those three daughters as well. Now later on, revisionists came, rewriting and rearranging the Quran to make it more palatable and easy to understand, to try to unscramble the theological eggs that it is. And they said, those verses don't belong in the Quran. They are satanically inspired. They were inspired and put there, but they're satanically inspired. They became known as the Satanic Verses. You may remember a well-known and very successful author named uh, Salman Rushdie wrote a book 15, 20 years ago called the Satanic Verses. And the Muslims were infuriated. And the imams around the world, all of them put out this fatwa, which is a command to assassinate Rushdie. And as a result, he went into hiding for several at least two decades. They're still trying to kill him. 
But because he wrote the truth about what was going on, with the illegitimacy of their scriptures, they were very, very angry. Now, that's the truth about Allah. And Mohammed, just very quickly, their revered prophet, and I don't have time to get into a lot of this right now, but he is their prophet. He's also, they claim, one of the original penmen of the Koran. Of course, it's all inspired. And they're real big on the idea that Muhammad wrote the Koran, the major part of it. There's only one problem with that, and that is Muhammad never wrote anything. In fact, he couldn't even read. He was totally illiterate. The fact of the matter is, he was a peon in his society, and he married a very wealthy woman who was ashamed of the standing and the status of her new husband. Muhammad was an epileptic. He would go into fits and he would go uh, get in these catatonic stupors and then he would start speaking in these uh, mumblings and jumblings and she said, that's an ecstatic language. He's speaking the language of God. And she would get the slaves to come around and take notes and say, what he's receiving is the word of God. And they would jot these things down. And when he came out of his stupor, she convinced him that you are in, you're, you're in a zone where God has your total submission and he's speaking through you his truths. Muhammad was convinced. He reached into his pantheon of gods, of all the pagans of which he was one and which his father had worshipped with as well. And he chose a religion. And that religion justified what he did next. At the promptings of his wife who knew he was poor, he went out with a small group of believers and he began to assault caravans. Wealthy, riches-laden caravans. And he would attack those and he would say to those whom he brought into submission that you will either accept Islam, Allah as your God, or you will die. And that's how the religion began. Once he saw he was successful at this, and he was mightily successful, he took his armies, which were growing rapidly, and attacked cities. And he would bring those cities into to submission. And then he would attack governments. And pretty soon we have what we have today. Islam is a, is, a, is a religion of the sword. It is a bloody religion. And that's how he conquered, and that's how so much of the world... And by the way, it's still their desire and their design. They want to kill you. They get rewarded for killing you. You say, well, why me? I'm just, I'm nobody. You're a Christian. You're a threat. If you're a Jew, you're worth two coupons. Two tickets to heaven. They hate Christians, they hate Jews. A long, long, long time before this revered prophet Muhammad came into existence, there were those who took the Hajj, which was the holy trip that Muslims now say is a requirement to enter into heaven. Eventually, everyone must take the Hajj, the, the, the trip, the holy trip to, to Mecca. But pilgrimages were going there long before, again, and you need to remember this, long before Muhammad came and demanded that they go to Mecca. They were already going to Mecca. And there was there, when they got there, and still is, the Kaban. There's a big cube, black cube, and it sits there, and they run around it seven times. And then they go up and they kiss the black stone. And then they run down to the, to the river, down in the valley, and they throw rocks at the devil. This is what he commanded them to do. These pagans, pre-Islamic, pre-Mohammed, also had a fast that they would enter annually, and they still do, called Ramadan. Again, something long before Mohammed came along and said, all these rituals... 
All these rituals are things that God gave me and He told me to tell y'all, you've got to do these things. And he writes later that I was inspired. I got this word from God to begin these new things in my lifetime. So what do you leave with tonight? And again, we're just trying to lay some foundation. What I have to share with you next week will blow you away about where we are today in relation to the plan of the Muslim and Islamic faith. I tell you, you have, you, you'll be shocked to see how close we are to the implementation of their theolo- the, the theocracy, taking over of society by their God. You say, well, I believe in God, Phil. Do you? You do well, Jesus said, because the demons in hell believe in God. What does it mean to people when they say, I believe? I mean, everybody almost, I think it's 98% of the Americans say, I believe in God. Ask an American Indian, the tree is God. Hindu is God. Shiva is God to millions. Krishna. But the favorite God of choice of the average American is the God of your imagination. Islam's God does not line up with the God of the Bible. But neither does the concept that most Christians or people in churches today who go under the name of Christian lines up with it. Well, how do you know the difference? I I always tell a story about the girl. One time I was going somewhere and I stopped at a 7-Eleven and there was a girl standing out there in her little pants, just barely pants, in a halter top, loose, loose loose-looking child, smoking a cigarette, had a bottle in a package. And I stopped and I gave her a little gospel track and I said, Do you know Jesus? She said, well, what makes you think I don't know Jesus? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps the way you're dressed. Perhaps the way you look. Perhaps your lifestyle. Perhaps what you're doing to your body. Perhaps the fact that you have no semblance of a Christian. Perhaps, I didn't say that. bothers me when people who profess to be Christians still act like, hey, you know, when I, we were out eating at a pizza place one night and I walked past the table and a bunch of uh, young singles were sitting there drinking beer and carrying on and you could hear them cussing all over the place and I stopped and, and gave them a track and I said, uh, I'd like to let you all know about Jesus. He loves you. He has a plan for your life. Do you know Jesus? They say, well, uh, yeah, we're members of such and such Baptist church. We're Christians. And I said, please don't tell anybody that. (laughs) Keep it to yourself. True God liberates you. He doesn't enslave you to religion. He liberates you. But true God is the triune God of the Bible. The one that convicts, the one that draws, the one that changes people. He is the God of the Bible that is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is His Son. And that Jesus, unlike Muhammad, is a Savior of the world. He is a King, King of kings. He is the Lord of the lords. Unlike Muhammad. If you know that God, you know, one, He's alive, you know He's knowable, you know he's living in you, you know you can't walk far until he jerks your chain and brings you back. So you mean Christians never sin? No. Christians sin. You're a good example of that. I'm a good example of that. But the difference between us And they who don't know Him but only have a God of their imagination is this. He keeps on working. He who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. We get up. 
A righteous man falls seven times and he keeps getting up. But the Quran teaches us that we are to be obedient in every respect to the Quran and the teachings of our Iman. And even though the, 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 teachers, the, the Imans that teach have vast recognizable market difference in what they teach, often contradicting each other, still we're told that's the truth. There's no comparison, there's no place where these two religions meet. And by the way, Jehovah's Witness, the Jehovah's Witness come to the door, they are preaching a God that's very similar to the Muslim God. But the Jehovah's Witness God is not my God. Their Jesus is not my Jesus. He's different. Theirs is dead. No matter how much a person works, no matter how much they pray, no matter how much they slave away, how much they chant, they can play five times or five hundred times a day. It doesn't matter. Still going to go to hell because their God is deaf, dumb, mute, and dead. Christian God is alive. I wish I had the time to get into some of the things, but I need to give you a comparative idea of what we're looking at on just these three basic steps. The, 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 the religion of, of Islam is synonymous with death in every way. I read an article today that said 80% of the college Muslims, college students in Europe and the United States, 80% of the Muslims say, these are young students in universities and colleges all over the world, that it's okay to kill people. If the Imam tells you to kill them in the jihad, the, the holy war, it's okay. And not only okay, but preferred. You say, well, you don't sound very tolerant. Our multiculturalism states, we are to tolerate the intolerant. <laughs> and now, intolerance is killing. Tolerance. We've learned to Put up with it. Never, never allow yourself to get in a position in your life where you quit being angry at sin, angry at error, angry at apostates, angry, mad at false prophets. So well, we're not supposed to attack. You are supposed to attack. God said, I did not come to bring, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring a, a, a peace, I came to bring a sword to set you, to set you in, in variance with your brother. Does that mean you're to be mean and angry? And No. But you know the Word of God so that you can forcefully but gently explain to them the difference between their lie and the truth of God. And you'd be surprised how many of those people will bend and break and their sensitivity to the Holy Spirit will burst forth and they'll come to Christ. It happens all the time. Millions, literally millions of Muslims all over the Middle East are coming to Christ. Even though it's against the law in countries like Saudi Arabia and so many of those Muslim-controlled countries to even mention the name of Jesus as the Messiah, as the Lord, as the King, as the Savior, millions are still coming to Christ because they're hungry, they're starving for truth. And we have it. That's what this church is about. That's what this pastor's about. That's what this people's about. Getting truth out telling the world this is the answer. Let's bow. As I have only been able to scratch